Okay, our learning objectives here for the webinar is uh, one, we're going to start taking a look at the um, just kind of the basic fund accounting principles and what's some practical applications. So what um, what's the difference between fund accounting uh, and normal kind of standard practice, normal accounting? So we'll take a look at that. We'll then kind of take that and show how it kind of manifests into chart of account structures for churches and nonprofits and understand a couple of customization things that you can do to tailor them to each specific organization. Then we'll take a look at some specialized nonprofit reporting, including generating the Form 990 report. And then lastly, we'll take a look at Gusto, who is our partner for providing payroll services and how that can integrate into our software or a fund accounting software uh, to track payroll, housing allowance, tax payments, all of that stuff. All right. So <clears throat> kind of an overview. So common tasks uh, of an accountant. Um, I, I would assume that most people in the room here are a CPA, an accountant, a bookkeeper, someone kind of directly or indirectly involved with the finances of a church or a nonprofit whether you be someone that provides services or someone that actually has to do it on a daily basis. But for those people that are accountants or bookkeepers in these types of organizations, uh, there's a ton of responsibility that goes along with that. So you have to support the unique goals of the organization. So each nonprofit or church kind of has a, a mission that they're trying to accomplish, right? So um, you want to make sure that what we're doing on a daily basis is kind of executing that vision. So how does that then filter into how we Intertransactions, you know, kind of everything has to be going towards this kind of bigger goal that the entire organization is working towards. You also have to assist in setting up a chart of accounts that also kind of supports the unique goals of the above. So, uh, you know, if you want to track how well uh, certain departments or teams or ministries or events or trips or things are doing, you have to make sure that the chart of accounts and the structure and everything that you do on the bookkeeping side kind of correlates or at least gets you to uh, being able to track information for those things. Because at the end of the day, it all boils down to reports, right? So you have to be able to throw a report at a department or ministry head and say, here's how you're doing. Here's how much you've spent, received. Here's how much you have. Here's how much you're doing compared to your budget. All of those things are answers to questions which are built from a, a chart of accounts and an accounting structure that can accommodate for all those things. You also then have to kind of take that and configure it into an accounting software. So ideally you say, here's where we're going. Here's the chart of accounts that can get us there. Now I have to make sure that that chart of accounts works in whatever software we decide to work with. Some people or excuse me, some softwares allow for things that others don't. So you have to kind of configure that into an accounting software, learn the software, learn how it's going to be used in order to accomplish your, your goals there. You then might have to advise bookkeepers on how to navigate the complexities of not only the software and the chart of accounts and the organization, but also now fund accounting, which is weird and different than normal accounting, and it confuses a lot of people. And then finally, at the end of the day, you then have to be responsible for answering the questions people ask you, which are then supported by reports. So again, kind of at the end of the day, any accounting system, whether it be fund or normal, um, you create a chart of accounts, you use that chart of accounts when entering transactions and keeping track of you know, the, the ins and outs on a daily basis, you then use that to produce reports. So as an accountant for someone that is a, you know, responsible for a nonprofit or church, there's probably a thousand things I didn't list, but those kind of five are, are kind of overview and, and just kind of imply that there, there's a lot of things to keep in mind here. So how can you make that kind of more straightforward or easy so that it makes your life a little bit easier? Well, first, let's talk about what fund accounting is. So uh, the difference that makes fund accounting hard is with normal kind of business accounting, for those of you who are familiar, um, it is, if you take a look at it, pretty linear. I mean, it can be tremendously complicated, but for the most part, you have money that comes in, you have money that goes out. The profit is then either saved or it's spent to fuel other things. You might owe money, you might have money owed that's owed to you, but at the end of the day, you kind of can come up with a pretty... Uh, a straightforward number of what's you know what's my assets what's my liabilities and then how much do I have left over which would be equity or how much you how much you kind of worth after all that that's business accounting now with fund accounting everything I just said then has to be split or done separately by fund a fund is a uh, I think it's going to be mentioned here in a later slide but um, it, it is what's called a self-balancing set of accounts which means take your chart of accounts listed from assets all the way down to expenses vertically, and then copy and paste it you know, into a different column for each fund that you have. Because essentially each fund has its own assets, its own liabilities, its own income expense, 
which also gives it its own equity. So each fund is almost like its own little mini organization within the larger total framework of the organization you're working with. And we'll take a look at some examples and how that plays out here in just a little bit. But first, let's stop for poll number one. So remember, poll where well, there's going to be four polls in order to get the CPE credit. You have to participate in at least three of them. So here is the first poll, right? Oh, excuse me. There are five of them, but anyways, so here's the launch poll. Question is, do you currently serve nonprofit or church clients? Select one of the following. Yes, I'm an in-house employee of a nonprofit or church. Uh, yes, I'm an outsourced accountant, auditor, or advisor, or no, not right now. Okay, 30% said, yes, I'm in-house employee of a nonprofit or a church. Great. 57%, I'm an outsourced person. 13%, no, or not right now. Great. And someone asked, what are the CPE requirements? Uh, that is, you have to participate in the majority of the polls, so three out of five. Um, you also have to be present for 50 minutes of the webinar. And then at the end, there's an evaluation survey that you have to complete. So don't uh, bounce too fast from the webinar. There is a, uh, a survey that you have to complete. Someone else said that you have another webinar at the top of the hour. Uh, I think the survey is pretty quick. I'm going to try to end a couple of minutes before the hour. So that should give you plenty of time to get through that. Alrighty, here we go. So it's poll number one. Great. So. Like I said, fund accounting is like its own little mini organization within the larger total, self-balancing set of accounts. So how does that play out? So fund accounting principles, the first of which, and this is kind of the core underlying point of doing fund accounting versus business accounting, is there's a focus on transparency rather than profitability. The uh, Again, this can be, this is a very dumbed down example, but with a business, your goal is to make profit, profit to you know, give back to the employees, to further other business practices, to do whatever. But for the most part, you're trying to do something, provide a product or a service in order to generate revenue to keep yourself going, right? Well, with nonprofits and churches, they might do some of that, but the primary uh, funding for them is typically uh, not from revenue generating services or products. It's typically from either donor gifts or uh, some sort of grant or, you know, so someone externally giving money to, for them to accomplish their goal because it's a public service for the most part. So there's kind of this focus on transparency, wanting to make sure that the money we have is being allocated properly, kept, kept track of up to date so that we can kind of be, um, for the lack of a better word, transparent. So we can be open, we can be, um, you know, uh, accountable with our money rather than just trying to turn a profit on what we're providing. <clears throat> so another principle here is it separates all of an organization's accounting by fund. And by accounting, we mean everything. So all areas of accounting. Like I said, each fund has its own income, expense, but also asset balances, liability balances, and equity at the end of the day. So again, take your chart of accounts. You know, if you're thinking, we're, we're all accountants here, right? So think in terms of a spreadsheet. Column A is the list of your accounts. And column B then would be the set of accounts again, but for fund one, fund two, fund three, so on and so forth. So uh, again, we'll take a look at some examples, but um, each fund kind of has its own uh, chart of accounts, if you will. So here's an example. So in general accounting, kind of in a revenue standpoint, you would get revenue that then goes into the normal kind of, you know, you don't really have a fund. So it just kind of goes into net profit for the year. And then you spend money and that kind of keeps your purposes going. With fund accounting, you have the income and expense, but it might be coming in and out of different funds. So for example, you have a general fund, maybe a grant fund and a facility fund. Each one of these would need to show that we've received a certain amount, we've spent a certain amount, and now we have blank at the end of the day to do whatever we need to do. But each one kind of has its own uh, standing there, if that makes sense. Uh, fund accounting also obeys self or donor designated restrictions. We'll take a look at that a little bit more, but for the most part, that money that's coming in externally that needs to be transparent um, can either be uh, kind of self designated. You can kind of allocate things how you want it to be allocated, or if someone gives you money for a particular purpose, you now have a responsibility to track that balance of money uh, uniquely from everything else. So here's an example. So let's say you have a checking account and in that checking account was $3,000. It's your money. You know, it's the, the initial amount of money that you've made as a nonprofit. You then write a grant and you now get given a grant for $5,000. Great. Now you have $8,000. So you go to the bank, you deposit the $5,000 and you look at your checking account and you go, awesome. There's $8,000 now that I've almost got triple what I had a second ago. Great. Now I can do whatever I want. 
No, not necessarily. Five thousand of that th of that eight is actually grant money. So that is a designated fund that you now need to keep track of because most likely the grant says here's five thousand dollars to do these things and make sure that you're spending this money that we've trusted you with on these things. And if you don't, you can get in trouble. So that's where a fund accounting kind of system comes into play, where all of the money is sitting in one bank account. You don't want to have to open up a separate separate bank account for every you know allocation of money that you have keep track of. So you put it into one bank account, but you need to be able to kind of split it by fund in order to see how much you have for each thing. So in that kind of vein of restricted funds, uh, again, kind of two uh, versions of this. So uh, previously up until recent times, there's been different allocations. There was unrestricted funds, um, which by the way, net asset means fund, it's the same it's synonymous. So when someone says net assets, they just mean funds. So it used to be called unrestricted, temporarily restricted, and permanently restricted net assets or funds, three designations. That has recently changed to just basically be restricted or unrestricted. Uh, unrestricted, like non-donor designated or donor designated. Uh, but really, I, I like unrestricted versus restricted because restricted can be a couple of different things. So uh, one of them can be donor restricted. So someone comes up and says, hey, I'm a donor. I want to give you a thousand dollars, but you have to spend the thousand dollars doing this thing or for this purpose. If you accept the money, you've said, "Great, I'll take your thousand dollars, and I will accept your terms." And so now, you, as the acceptor, have a responsibility to take that thousand and allocate it separately for that purpose of which you've accepted it for. And so that way, if that donor ever comes back and says, "Hey, how's that thousand dollars doing?" Did you use it to buy pizza for the staff or did you do it for what I told you to do it for? You can now give them a report saying, nope, we've been spending it accordingly. Here's the thousand dollars. We spent $200 of it on these things which are related to what you wanted. And so now we have $800 left. That would be an example of a donor restricted fund. Uh, donor restricted fund can also apply to bigger organizations that give money for reasons or grants or that kind of thing. Really any of those external people that are giving you money for a particular thing would be a donor restricted fund. You can also have restricted funds that are not donor designated. They are self restricted, meaning um, let's say your, your staff or your board has said, here is our total amount of unrestricted money. We want to take a chunk of that and self designate it to something, uh, a building fund, a missions fund, an outreach or, or a facility fund, something like that, to where you're kind of stashing money away to have its own balance and income and you know everything. Um, but it's the donors didn't tell you to do it. You're kind of self-designating that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I see it a lot in terms of board designated. So usually the board will say, um, you know, here's, a, you know, here's a, a pool of money. Let's kind of take this chunk and put it over here. Um, that is technically still. I mean, it's still yours. You don't necessarily have to obey a donor or a granting agency to spend that money, but you've also you, now you have to answer to your board, pretty much. So your board in that case is the ones that you'd have to go to for approval in order to spend, modify, or, or remove those funds. So they're not donor restricted, but they all are self restricted. So again, kind of two buckets of restricted funds. <clears throat> Uh, so like I said earlier, um, each fund is a self-balancing set of accounts. So kind of a recap, uh, funds focus on transparency rather than profitability. You separate all of an organization's accounting, entire accounting uh, by fund, and then you obey self or donor designated restrictions. And then each fund is a self-balancing set of accounts. So here's that example of what I was talking about for you spreadsheet people. So let's say you have your organization and you have three funds. In a non-fund accounting system, you'd have the list of accounts, assets, liabilities, equity, income, expense. But with a fund accounting system, you basically take that same chart of accounts and you kind of copy and paste it for all three. So in the sake of example, you might have an office supplies expense account. Let's say you have three funds. You can have one office supplies expense account and then per transaction, just choose what fund it's coming out of. So you don't necessarily have to have you know, if you had 100 accounts, you don't need to have 300 accounts. It just means you have 100 accounts, but they can be used kind of dimensionally for three different unique funds. Because with a fund accounting system, you should be able to get to uh, an income statement or a balance sheet or a, uh, a transaction list, any type of report for the entire organization or linearly for one column at a time being either for one fund at a time. So I can say, here's my balance sheet for fund three. 
or I can say, here's my balance sheet for the entire organization. So again, kind of taken as a whole, or you should be able to kind of split further down into one particular fund at a time. <clears throat> Let's do the second poll really quick here. Question is, what software do you typically recommend for your nonprofit clients to manage their bookkeeping? QuickBooks Online, QuickBooks Desktop, Applos, Intact, or other? Okay. 23% said QuickBooks Online, 36% said QuickBooks Desktop, 25% said Applos Accounting, zero intact, sorry, intact, and 17% other. Great. Thank you very much. All right, poll number two. Okay, so chart of account structures. We went through an overview of what fund accounting is. Um, I realize that this is also kind of skipping a rock. This is probably going to trigger a ton of questions, and that's fine. If you want more information, we're always happy to provide more. But uh, now let's take a look at how this kind of then manifests into chart of accounts structures. So transparency, each fund is its own kind of self you know, thing. Uh, so how does this then manifest into a chart of accounts? So as a nonprofit, you need to be able to account for tracking your funds. You need to have unique nonprofit financial reports, which uh, is pretty much all that means is you need to be able to run financial reports by fund. Uh, you also might need to do some Form 990 reporting, depending on how large you are as an organization. And you also might want to account for uh, projects, programs, departments, ministries, trips, uh, any kind of uh, kind of side effort that is a part of the overall mission of the organization. So uh, let's look at some examples here. So funds in, in a fund accounting system are created as equity accounts in your chart of accounts. Um, and or, or net assets. So really all it is, it's an equity split because when you split your equity, it assumes that um, the equity is built up of assets and liabilities, right? So if you have assets minus liabilities equals equity, then if I need to have an equals something for a fund, it needs to be at equity because I also need to see that I have a cash balance and receivables for a fund, but then I have debt. And so at the end of the day, I have a fund balance that is, you know, distinct from other fund balances. So each fund is created as its own equity account. Uh, in terms of assets and liabilities, and for the most part, income and expenses, uh, nothing really changes between standard accounting and fund accounting. Um, reason being, assets and liabilities are indicative of real balances. And what I mean by that is you typically don't have more asset accounts than you do actual like assets to track. Not typically. And same with liabilities. You wouldn't want to just have extra liability accounts created in excess of, you know, things that you owe. So for an example, if you have one checking account and one savings account, you would want two asset accounts, checking, saving, not necessarily checking A, checking B, checking three, you know, checking four, you know, one for each kind of separate balance that you need to keep track of that would become pretty hard to track after a while. So you want one account. Uh, same with liabilities. If you have a accounts payable, you know, balance, and then a vehicle loan, you tip. You just need two liabilities, and that's pretty much it. With income and expenses, they're descriptive of activity. So instead of just seeing that we made a hundred thousand last year and we spent eighty, so we have a profit of twenty, that's not enough information. <laughs> you need more. So what you need to do is create accounts that are then kind of descriptive of the money that you've received, the money that you spend. So that way, when you provide the income statement report, it tells more of a story rather than just kind of giving a snapshot. So income and expenses are descriptive of activity. For example, uh, if you receive money from contributions, grants, you might also want to have a separate account for you know, what's come in designated versus not. Uh, you might have pledge income that you want to track separately and then sales revenue, all five of which would kind of tell the story of we got this much money and this is how we get that much money. So you know, contributions is uh, then kind of clearly seen as a driver. You know, this is where most of our money comes from with sales revenue, bringing in, you know, supplemental uh, things here and there. But that again, kind of is descriptive of uh, being able to provide that report and say, here's how our organization makes money. And then likewise, here's how our organization spends money. So if you have just, I spent 80,000, then that's not enough because what if, you know, salary is 70 of the 80 and supplies are the extra 10, you would then tell more of a story of saying we spent 80 and we're really heavy in the salary department or salary super low, but we spend a lot on rent or supplies or fees or whatever. Any of those expense accounts then kind of begin to describe the activity of how you spend the money. So what funds do is they add dimension to this. So like I said earlier, you'd have the same chart of accounts just kind of broken out in the equity section per the fund. 
Because in a fund accounting system, what you do is you pick two things with every transaction. You pick an account and you pick a fund. So for instance, you'd say, you know, I want to choose contributions income for my general fund. That would then add to, it would increase the income account like normal. It would increase the asset account where you deposited like normal. But it would also say that it was then for the general fund. So it would increase the income statement for the general fund. It would increase the balance sheet for the general fund because that money got put into the general fund within the checking account. And then later you can use the same income account, but call it the missions fund. Now it's done the same thing. It's increased the missions fund. It's increased the missions balance sheet, put the money in the same income account and the same checking account as before, but now into a different fund. So um, this is kind of a hokey example, but think of your bank account as a pair of pants and each fund is a different pocket. So it's, it's all contained within the same pair of pants, but if you have one pocket, it's pretty easy to track where your money is. But as soon as you have a second pocket, you have the same amount of money. You just can now separate it into two different distinct places. If that makes sense. Again, kind of a hokey example. So here's uh, another example. So in a normal business chart of accounts, you'd have this is kind of a trial balance here. You'd have a uh, uh, asset balance of $10,000. You'd have liabilities of three. Equity overall of seven, because 10 minus three is seven. You then can take a look at an income statement saying we showed, or, you know, we, we received five, spent four. Great. So in a fund accounting system, what this would show is the same information. So again, the total is the exact same, if you notice, 10, three, seven, five, and four. But what this is showing is that $10,000 is not actually the same. It's not all the same, right? That 10,000 is made up of three different funds. I have $3,000 in my fund one, 3,000 in fund two, and the remaining 4,000 in fund three. Liabilities are also split. So I want to show that I have $1,000 against my fund one, $2,000 against fund two, but fund three is debt free. So that's where I get my equity numbers of, I have a $4,000 fund balance in fund three, $1,000 fund balance in fund two, and $2,000 fund, $2, fund balance in fund one. So again, each fund is completely unique, even in the income area. So this would show the story of fund one is my driver of income and expenses. That is the majority of what I'm receiving and spending, right? With, oops, excuse me, with fund two and three also having a little bit of income and expense, but, but not as much. So this, again, would, would auto, already show you a tremendous amount of information more than a standard business uh, chart of accounts and system because you can split it into what, what's actually kind of driving it and where the balances lie. So car, a common chart of accounts examples here. So um, just kind of some examples of what would warrant kind of a fund structure here it would be a grant that would support a specific program, but doesn't cover all the expenses. So in that regard, let's say that you have the grant and says, you know, we're going to give you um, well, it's, so I'm, I'm on the board for a nonprofit and there's this kind of data project that we're trying to do, we're trying to raise money in order to go out and run, you know, numbers from multiple organizations and, and kind of city entities in order to kind of aggregate data and produce a report on this demographic that we want to serve. We want to get a grant that helps us do that. Well, um, you know, for that purpose, we're going to spend our own money uh, because if we don't get a grant, then it's something we're doing. But maybe the grant says, great, here's, you know, here's $5,000 to do that. The project might cost 10. But in that case, what I want to do is I want to track that for these particular set of, you know, expense accounts, these per or these, uh, you know, expenses that I'm budgeting for, I want to show that I spent 10, but 5,000 5, of it was from this grant and 5,000 was from this, you know, my, my general fund. Right. So uh, the grant would be set aside specifically um, for that particular program, but you can also show that other funds have kind of contributed to it as well. Another example would be an endowment with interest. So the principal might be re restricted. So someone uh, passes away or donates a, uh, a you know some sort of like endowment or some sort of um, investment, but says you can't touch the principal. But anything that this thing generates as far as interest, you can use it for whatever you want. So that would be two different funds. So the asset balance for the principal would be set aside into this endowment fund, untouchable. That that would fluctuate with market value or whatever, but um, that essentially is is untouchable. So you can't do that. But then when the interest income comes in, you then record that going into a completely separate fund, which then fuels whatever you want it to fuel. Another example would be a church with a missions fund. So kind of in the terms of self-designated uh, funds here. So let's say that the church wants to kind of self-allocate or dedicate 15% of contributions each month toward missions. 
So they would receive everything into one fund because they need to kind of get the total before they know how much 15% is. So let's say they received, you know, $1,000. They would then take 150 of it and do a, you know, in Apple's, we call it a fund transfer, but a kind of a redesignation to call it, this is an actual general fund money. We're going to self-designate this and stash it aside, 15% of it, to go to the missions fund. So that would then kind of separately allocate that balance out to the missions fund so that they can track those things separately. Another example would be a church that also operates a preschool and needs to be able to split payroll or other types of expenses and receivables for the preschool versus the church. You know, if the, if the preschool is not its own separate entity, but rather just kind of underneath the umbrella of the church, then a fund would be a good way to be able to track. Here's how much the school has, is owed, owes, has received, spends. Again, completely set of, completely different set of financial reports for the preschool outside of the entire uh, other operations of the church. All righty, poll number three. Question is, what is your experience level with Excel? Just the basics. I'm comfortable with formulas and basic graphs. I work regularly in pivot tables and large data, or I consider myself an Excel pro. It's weird how much I've come to appreciate a good spreadsheet. <laughs> Seven years ago, when I started with Applos, I, I knew nothing about accounting. I, I I knew that Excel was a program, and I knew that you could put colors in the cells, but that that was about it. I didn't know how to do any sort of formula or anything like that. Uh, and so, all of my kind of experience with that has been kind of self-taught and uh, and definitely learned from uh, you know the people that work at Applos. But it uh, man, it has just completely transformed the way that I do work and even think. I tend to think in terms of spreadsheets now, which is fun, but uh, I'll go equally kind of sad to the, <laughs> to the person that, that uh, like my wife just makes fun of me for that constantly. But anyway, close poll. 17% uh, said just the basics with Excel. 63% uh, I'm comfortable with formulas and basic things. 19% I work regularly in pivot tables and large data. And 2% self-identified as an Excel pro. Well, welcome Excel pros. You are few and far between. Uh, Let's see, Paul, uh, I'm just looking at the questions real quick, make sure we don't have anything here. Um, uh, so those questions I'll be able to address here at the end. So let's keep going. Okay, so got some ground to cover. Okay, so uh, we took a look at what fund accounting was, what's the chart of account kind of examples here. So now uh, let's say that you understand fund accounting <laughs> the assumption. Let's say that you also designed a chart of accounts that now accommodates for funds. So then you go and you enter transactions. And again, the, the kind of point of an accounting system is to be able to answer financial questions and provide financial data. And that is done in reports. So tracking your funds correctly is essential for nonprofit reporting. A couple of funds here that come into, or excuse me, a couple of reports here that come into play. One of which would be what's called the statement of financial position, uh, otherwise known in layman's terms as the balance sheet. Same thing. Assets uh, equals liabilities plus equity, or put another way, assets minus liabilities equals equity. That is the statement of financial position. Statement of activities is uh, otherwise known as the income statement or profit and loss report. Uh, here's my income, here's my expenses, and here's my net income at the end of the day. Uh, something that's kind of special about a fund income statement or a fund statement of activities is there's also a separate section at the bottom that's called other fund balance movements, which we'll take a look at here in just a little bit. But something that affected the fund balance that was not income or expense. So we'll take a look at that. You also be able to want to, or excuse me, you also want to be able to run a report that shows you the cash balance by fund. So similar to a few slides ago, showing checking is ten thousand. You want to see that my checking is ten thousand. Yeah, but but how much is in each pocket? You know. So here is a uh, here's the ten thousand, and how, here's how it's split up by fund. And then the statement of functional expenses, um, very, very similar to kind of a 990 report, kind of breaks your expenses up into different categories. We'll take a look at that here in just a second. So here's an example uh, of a statement of financial position or a balance sheet by fund. So notice that um, it's, it's not added here, but you could have a total column that shows the entire asset, liability, and equity balance across the board for the nonprofit. But each fund is its own column. So the general fund, missions, and building fund all have their own distinct asset balances, liability balances, and equity overall worth. 
Same with an income statement. So same funds, uh, different order, which has always bugged me. I don't know why that went to a different order, but here's the income statement. So you can see that the general fund is the main driver of income with missions and building also have a couple of, having a couple of things there. And then for the expenses, same thing. And then the net income at the bottom showing here's the total profit or loss for each one of my funds. Now, so I mentioned the other fund balance movements. At the end of a, of a fund income statement, there should be some sort of summary at the bottom that brings you to kind of correlate with the balance sheet. So an example of this would be, um, so the general fund, let's say my beginning fund balance before this period of time for the income statement was almost $18,000, $17,780. We then had a net income of $27,981.98, but then we had other fund balance movements of negative 200, so the, the kind of sum of everything leads me to an ending fund balance of $45,500. The beginning fund balance and the ending fund balance should correlate with the balance sheet by fund for that fund at the beginning and ending of whatever period the income statement covers. Uh, the other fund balance movements, what that is there is stuff that will impact the fund balance, but that does not fall within the terms of income or expense. A couple of common examples here would be payment of debt. You're reducing a liability, so it's not an expense. Uh, you're just paying off what you already owe. So in that case, you would reduce the liability, you reduce cash, that would reduce your fund balance, but it's not expense. So you would want to throw that into kind of this, this bucket of other things that have hit the fund, which would be that part of that negative number. Another example would be the receipt of, um, you know, accounts receivable kind of on the flip side. So if you had, um, now that's a little bit different because that might have already been counted as income, but maybe some sort of asset that you were expecting, some sort of endowment or something that you've received, but it wasn't income. Uh, or, or maybe you sold an asset. So let's say you sold a vehicle it might, in your building fund, and so it's still building money that was generated, but you just kind of traded the value of an asset for you know cash or something. So that would show up there. Uh, another example that we see often here is a fund transfer. So if you look at the building and the missions fund, both of which are 1700 but one's negative, one's positive, well, that kind of tells the story of most likely because those amounts are equal to each other, what happened is we transferred money from the building fund to the missions fund. So building fund had a had a, uh, a removal of money, that building fund went down, whereas missions fund went up. Your total cash balance would have stayed the exact same. You're just kind of taking money from my left pocket to my right pocket. But again, that kind of other fund balance movements then just kind of tells the story of, you know, here's where we started, here's our net income, here's everything else that kind of messed with the fund in order to get us to our ending fund balance at the end of the day. The statement of functional expenses uh, breaks your total expenses up uh, by fund, but for different kind of uh, categories here. So like you'd have basically, here's your total administrative expenses, and then you'd have your kind of administrative expenses by fund. Uh, I don't have an example here, but it kind of correlates a lot to the, um, the 990 report as well, where it breaks things up into the kind of program services, management in general, and then fundraising stuff. So again, it kind of just further splits your money up into different categories. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the 990 report here in a, in a bit, but that's uh, another just example of a common kind of nonprofit report. Uh, ironically, I've never seen one in the wild. You know, I, I studied it and it's there, but uh, I've never actually been given a report that is a statement of functional expenses. Uh, let's go through uh, first, uh, before we move on, let's just look at a couple of common pitfalls. So this relates to if you're using a non-fund accounting system to track a church or a nonprofit. Some things that you might see here is uh, one, you might have created more asset accounts than actual accounts. So like I said earlier, if you have a checking account, you only want one asset account for that checking account. If you don't have a fund accounting system and you're trying to keep balances separate, you might have done a workaround to do a sub account structure to say, here's checking, but then I need a general checking, a missions checking, or a building checking. Uh, you might have also gone as far to go to the bank and open up separate bank accounts. But you know, in this example, this is a you know this is where the accounting system would have more detail than the actual bank. Uh, but the downside is this is one reconciliations would be very hard to do. So now you'd get one bank statement, but now it's split across, you know, three or four or more assets. So reconciliation would be uh, kind of a nightmare. And also this only applies now to checking. So if you had to do this then for your savings and petty cash and inventory, you'd have to do the same thing for every single account. 
So what it would do is it it would cause you to have a larger chart of accounts with multiple sub account structures in play. Uh, so there's an example. So here, like in this case, I've got the checking and the savings both kind of in the same format. I have added four funds, so I need to have now eight extra accounts just to have a separate balance sub account underneath checking and savings. Uh, again, uh, not this is only two accounts, you know. So if if every account needs to be split like that, you're now looking at four times however many accounts you have in addition that you need to create a sub account. Um, then also another downside with this would be you'd have to do some manual reporting to find out what your cash balance by fund would be. So you'd have to take those, you know, 0.1 sub accounts from earlier and kind of add them together to see that, you know, these two sub accounts for two different accounts equal a total of 12,000 for the cash. But again, this doesn't re represent any other assets or liabilities or fund balance. This is simply how much cash you have. And it's already quite the workaround. Uh, you can also get into trouble if you only track funds as um, classes. Classes is a kind of QuickBooks term, but what I mean by that is any sort of um, other parameter outside of your chart of accounts that some systems allow so that you can kind of tag or, or class or um, kind of categorize transactions. Um, usually where those end is with the income statement. So you can get to activity but that's only one side of the coin. You need to know not only how much activity I had, but what was my beginning ending fund balance? Well, the income statement won't show you that. So by, by tracking a fund as a class, you kind of lose that beginning and ending fund balance without having to do a pretty good amount of work around. Um, so here's an example of how that balance sheet would look like in QuickBooks. Again, kind of just an example of using sub accounts there. Um, yeah. I don't really have any text on that, but but essentially with all these things kind of in play, let's just play out the example. Let's say you had the, the funds tracked as, as classes, so you can get to the income and expense. So now what you'll have to do is run an income statement by class to see how much profit has come in or out. You then take that net number and have to record it into the right cash account, uh, which keeps the cash sub account up to date. But then you have to combine that report and post a manual entry from one equity account to the other to kind of get the fund balances. So again, using a non-fund accounting system like a QuickBooks or something like that uh, to track fund accounting would involve multiple workarounds and a tremendous amount of work to keep up to date, as I'm sure some of you have experienced. So let's do poll number four. Poll number four, what areas do you see your nonprofit and church clients needing the most assistance in for financial health? Following financial, or excuse me, following fund accounting guidelines, tracking their donations, preparing the Form 990, preparing and understanding their financial reports or other. 28% said following fund accounting guidelines, 8% tracking their donations, 11% preparing 990s, 47% preparing and understanding financial reports, and 6% other. Great. Okay, we have only a few more minutes here, so I'm going to just kind of cook through the rest of this real quick. So uh, let's see, nonprofit specific. So uh, things that cater to specifically nonprofits. So at the end of the day, let's uh, say that you've got the chart of accounts set up, you understand it, you've used it, you've gotten to the specific reports that you need. Now what else? Well, sometimes you need to do a Form 990 if you're a nonprofit. If you're a religious organization, you're probably exempt from that. But for uh, for uh, uh, normal nonprofits, you need to do some sort of 990. And then you also need to produce contribution statements at the end of the year for those donors that have given you money for tax purposes. So for the Form 990, there's a few different forms here. The Form 990N is for any nonprofit that has $50,000 or less, well, uh, up to $50,000 of gross receipts or total income for the year. If you are under that threshold, then you're going to file the Form 990N, which takes about 30 seconds, and uh, that's an annual return. Form 990EZ is for anyone that's from $50,000 in gross receipts to $200,000 or under $500,000 in assets. So if you didn't have that much income, but you've got a million dollars worth of assets, they want you to do the EZ. Likewise, if you only have you know, uh, a couple bucks in the bank account, but you somehow you know, received a ton of money and spent a ton of money, you're going to need to file the EZ as well. Uh, the 990 then is for anybody that is over $200,000 in gross receipts and or over $500,000 in assets. Some entities, such as churches, are exempt from filing. Uh, the Form 990 financials are similar to that functional expenses thing where they categorize your expenses into three different buckets, the program service management in general and fundraising. Uh, in Aplos, we have a specific feature that goes along with that called 990 tags. 
So if you uh, need to track that, what it does is it allows you to kind of select what applicable 990 category and, uh, you know, what uh, – uh, program service management and general fundraising. So it allows you to select that alongside of what account, what fund, and what you know Apple's categories you want to use. So what it does is it allows you to kind of simultaneously track the 990 information and your financial information. So you don't have to cater your chart of accounts around the 990 categories because nobody wants that. And in contribution statements here, so at the end of the year, uh, you know they're due by January 31st typically. Um, so you want to be able to make sure that you're accurately tracking the donations and pledges that have come through. You need a software that tracks donor restrictions. Um, you know, well, that terminology is out of date, but you want to be able to basically show, hey, donor, here's how much you've given, and it was to this, that, and the other fund. So you want to be able to kind of provide an accurate report there. And you also need to be able to track the separation of tax-deductible donations versus non-tax-deductible donations which an example would be if someone gives you $50 to attend a banquet, but the ticket was $50, that's not a donation. That is in order for them to come in and have a meal uh, for the for the banquet. Now, if they would have said the ticket's 50 and they gave you 100, then anything over what was kind of deemed as payment for something received would be on top of the uh, requirements. So that would be a donation. So in that case, you'd have to split that donation and show that half of it was non-tax deductible and half of it was. So in a perfect world, your nonprofit financial system, if you could have one, would do all of the above. You'd have the fund accounting, which would then give you uh, the ability to you know, record donations and maybe even provide a donor portal for your donors to log in and give more money and run reports. It would allow you to receive donations online, track events, track you know, uh, customers or contact relation management software where you can see not only who's a donor, but who's a prospect. Who, who should I go take to lunch? In order to get them to become a more regular donor and how would i even determine that you know so a, a crm type software would help with that you also want to track grants you want to track scholarships all of the above and that gets into uh, why we as a system kind of are in play so aplos is trying to be kind of that one-stop shop solution for nonprofits and churches we have the majority of the circle here <laughs> some things are pretty unique like grant and scholarship management but fund accounting donor portals online donations some event management type thing in the CRM, we've got those covered and we hope to one day kind of have the full circle so that no matter what type of entity you are, you can use Aplos and you can have all of your bases covered in one system. Uh, one of the things that I also wanted to mention today is uh, with a system, you typically can't do everything. And sometimes people are a lot better at things than you can ever be. One of those examples for us is payroll. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to build our own payroll, at least not yet, and I doubt that we probably ever will. But uh, for that reason, we have searched far and wide for the best uh, partner for payroll integration that can allow for not only payroll, but payroll by fund as well, because that is super important. Some people get paid out of different funds and you know that kind of thing. So we have then landed with Gusto. Gusto is a fantastic payroll provider, and they do everything. They do the automatically calculates and pays your and files your federal and state and local payroll taxes, as well as produces W-2s, 1099s, and new hire forms. You have unlimited payrolls across all 50 states. Direct deposit comes standard. Uh, new employees go through kind of a self-onboard entirely online, so there's no like manual paperwork process you need to put them through. Uh, and also they get payday emails, lifetime accounts, direct deposit, and more. And if you're an Aplos customer, and I think I think overall, I'm not exactly sure, but there's also a free three-month uh, trial that you can go through as well. And they have a tremendous uh, support team, and they can help kind of transition you into their software very, very easily. So if you were to use that and Aplos, then you have the option to do kind of this integration here, which basically at the high level, would you'd run payroll, we would then kind of have all of your different payroll categories and stuff passed over to us, and that would come down here. So it'd say, here's kind of you know salaries and wages, here's the benefits you're tracking, here's the tax amounts, and then you would then kind of go through this mapping process, which takes uh, not very much time at all. And you'd say, when you see this category come over from Gusto, I want you to hit this account. This account, this thing from Gusto is this account. So you kind of map it. So then once you have it all mapped. You then can go to this screen here. It shows you how many payroll runs you have to import. So each time you run payroll, it would show up here. All you do is click import. That brings you to kind of a summary screen where you see all of the employees involved. You can also apply a custom mapping, which means if one of your employees needs to hit a different fund than everybody else, you can allocate them separately to what kind of divisions they need. And then at the end of the day, you just click import, and then that posts as a journal entry, and then you're fine. So. 
if, if, if the mapping doesn't change very often or at all, then once you get that done, each time you run payroll, all you do is click a couple of times and that journal entry then posts for you and everything is done, uh, keeping your accounting up to date while completely processing your payroll in a different system. So that is the integration with Gusto and Applos. All right. Well, I realize that it is 1056. So, uh, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just say that that is going to be all the time that we have today. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to download these questions here. There's not a ton, so I'm going to download these questions, and then I'm going to respond to each person individually. So if you have questions in the next, like, two minutes here, just shoot them into the question field, and then I will do my best to get everything answered and responded to you either today or tomorrow. Um, so for those of you who have just joined us, um, let's do one more poll real quick. Uh, and that poll is, are you interested in learning more about Apples for your nonprofit clients? Yes or no? Trick question. Better be yes. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, I'll give you a couple seconds there. But yeah, so this is the last poll. Again, you had to participate in at least three of the five polls. Uh, you had to be present for at least 50 minutes <clears throat> of the presentation, which if you're still here, then congratulations, you did it. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to close this in just a minute or two. And so there's going to be an exit survey that you have to complete. Make sure you complete that entire survey. You have to put your name and answer a couple questions. And there is something at the end that you have to trigger. Uh, and then that will then kind of give you credit for the CPE course um, that you need. Okay, let me close that poll and we will uh, shut it down for the day. So. Guys, I appreciate you taking the time. Sorry we ran a little bit late to do the Q&A, but again, post your questions here. I'll leave it open until the turn of the hour, so that way if you have questions, you can type those in there, <clears throat> and then I will do my best to answer everything at the end, or <laughs> do my best to answer everything uh, today or tomorrow, okay? And uh, a couple other housekeeping things is, yes, we were recording this, so if you have, um, you know, if the audio cut out or if you wanna watch it again, we're gonna be sending out a copy once we uh, kind of send the follow-up. Uh, email to everybody and then also if you want a copy of the slides and stuff you're welcome to have those just uh, just request one from us and we'll be sending that to you as well